in the next 15 20 minutes i am going to talk about uh, iron chelation in hematological disorders in fact i was telling dr maman chandi that all that i had to say was said by him in a very brief note on thalassemia yesterday in fact uh, he summarized it so well that there is very little left to speak on this subject but what i would like to do is i would like to say why should we use chelators what would be an ideal ion chelator? What are the currently available chelators? When and how to use them? The assessment of effect, both clinical and laboratory. The problems or controversies related to them and how to optimize treatment. I'll try to answer some of these questions. Uh, just um, to recapitulate, we know that iron in body is predominantly in the RBC compartment, about half of it, and rest of it is in the storage uh, tissues, macrophages, and liver, and also in the other proteins like myoglobin and enzymes. The iron, is very, iron metabolism is very tightly regulated. Most of the iron is uh, reutilized in the body, and only one to two milligrams of iron is actually required for normal homeostasis. However, as was said by Ms. Chairman, that there are situations when you get patients in whom this particular iron is supplied in a larger quantities. So it can be supplied in larger quantities when we are using transfusions or when the RBC mass is in, uh, increased, if there is an erythroid hyperplasia as occurs in congenital uh, anemias, which also results in an increase in absorption of iron from the gut by decreasing hepcidin and also increasing erythrocyte-dependent growth factor 15. So having talked about the homeostasis, what we should really say is why should we chelate iron? As I said, iron overload could be either primary, thereby meaning that iron is actually being absorbed more often. Uh, that is hemochromatosis that occurs in certain number of patients. But more often, we would see that it occurs secondary to <clears throat> either multiple transfusions and also, in addition to that, increased absorption related to ineffective erythropoiesis. Now, iron overload leads to generation of hydroxyl radicals after the uh, body ion stores are saturated and the transferrin is saturated. You have um, uh, iron which is actually not bound to transferrin and then it causes uh, generation of hydroxyl radicals and finally that leads to end organ damage. What it means is that basically it is a preventable cause of morbidity and mortality if you could use active chelation. So why use a chelator? You, could use, you would use a chelator because you could prevent morbidity and finally mortality that tends to occur in some of these patients related to iron overload itself. I think this is, this is the wish list that we would have for an ideal iron chelator. That is, it should prevent iron-mediated organ toxicity. Obviously, if it is a good chelator, it should do so. But it should also be associated with simplicity and ease of administration and monitoring, thereby meaning that an orally administered drug would be better than an injectable, and the de convenient dosage schedule should be there. It should be suitable for monotherapy, and it should have an acceptable toxicity profile, thereby meaning that when it is in an iron complex, it should be stable without any redistribution of iron, and when it is an iron-free drug, then the relationship to the dose should be constant. And finally, I think for our, all of us who come from this region, the drug needs to be inexpensive. I think this is not wish list for us. This is wish list for the world, basically. Everyone would actually like an inexpensive and um, uh, effective drug. But this is something that at this moment is not available, so we'll have to make do with whatever is available to us. The iron loading from blood transfusions, as was being said, occurs quite frequently, and one unit of blood contains approximately 200 milligrams of iron. Normally, 
Total body iron is approximately three to four grams, as I said. So chronic transfusion-dependent patients have an iron excess of 0.3 to 0.7 milligram per kg, equivalent to about four to 10 grams of iron per year. And we know that iron would accumulate with repeated blood transfusions because there is no way to eliminate iron from the body. So what is the current practice for initiation of treatment for iron overload? What is the time at which you would start as early as possible? No, basically when repeated blood transfusions are required, then iron would rapidly accumulate in the body. More often than not, the iron levels would become, the ferritin levels would increase after you've used about 20 units of iron. So chelation is generally initiated after 10 to 20 transfusions or more appropriately, if the serum ferritin was more than 1,000 micrograms per liter. If the iron loading is unclear, then sometimes liver iron concentrations may be measured. But liver iron concentration, as all of you know, is basically an invasive procedure. And therefore, more often than not, we would actually have to uh, rely on non-invasive techniques to think about the iron load. The next question would be, is this, okay, as to how do you monitor iron overload? And uh, one of the things that we use very frequently in our countries is uh, serum ferritin concentra concentration. It is a non-invasive technique. However, its accuracy in iron overload is questionable in the sense that serum ferritin can be elevated in certain situations for example, in chronic inflammation, because it is an acute phase reactant, and it can also be elevated in liver disease, in chronic uh, viral hepatitis, it can be increased in patients with alcoholic liver disease, and it can also be increased in patients with non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. There are ways of measuring liver iron content, and Dr. Maman Chandi uh, talked uh, about some of these, the squid and the MRI, the T2 star imaging, by MRI technique gives you an accurate uh, idea about iron overload. If we were to use liver iron concentration, it has been suggested that it accurately reflects the total body iron stores. And if you, if you look at this graph, where the stores were calculated by the quantitative phlebotomy, and the liver iron concentration was measured from biopsy samples, there is a linear relationship between the total body iron stores and the liver iron concentration. In patients who are multiply transfused, especially in patients with thalassemia major, it is suggested that when the hepatic iron content is between seven to uh, 15 milligrams, there is an increased risk of complications but threshold for cardiac disease and early death is at the level of 15 milligrams per gram of dry weight. And in thalassemia major, if they are not actually uh, chelated, it would occur between the ages of 10. It can start as early as the age of six, and they may go up to the age of 16 years. Plasma ferritin, as I told you, as an indicator of iron overload, may not be a very good indicator after the levels are about 3,000. And as you can see here in this particular graph, that the values actually are far away from the line that, that would suggest that they, there is any linear relationship. But it is inexpensive. It is available as a routine laboratory assay. And the values, as I told you, could be confounded. The liver iron concentration and serum ferritin uh, uh, the other issue that, that is important is that even though at one time uh, um, serum ferritin values may not actually reflect truly about the uh, iron overload, but sequential evaluation of ferritin levels provides a good index of chelation history. And it has been suggested that maintenance of serum ferritin below 2,500 micrograms per liter significantly correlates with cardiac disease-free survival. Uh, this um, graph from the study by Olivier et al. appeared long time back, but it suggests that patients who were on chelator, uh, chelation, if 
they, they had a value of serum ferritin below 2,500 microgram per liter for more than 67% of the times, that is this particular line, versus only 33% of the times, the rate of cardiac disease were significantly different. So the longer the levels are less than 2,500, lesser are the chances of cardiac disease. The currently available chelators that we have are three, deferoxamine, deferipron, and deferacirox. The later two are oral. Uh, deferoxamine is a hexadentate, and it, uh, whereas deferipron is bidentate, and deferacirox is tridentate. The dose for uh, deferoxamine is 25 to 60 milligrams per kg. It is given as an infusion. And uh, so it actually requires um, injection several times a week, about at least five days a week, whereas deferiprone is given in 75 to 100 milligrams uh, per day in thrice daily dosages, and deferocirox in 20 to 30, and recently it has been suggested that you can go up to 40 milligrams per kg once daily on an empty stomach. The route of excretion for deferoxamine is both urinary and fecal. For deferiprone, it is urinary, and for deferocirox, it's fecal. The adverse events are uh, local and ocular and auditory for deferoxamine with growth retardation. Deferiprone actually causes some GI disturbances. The more disturbing ones were arthralgias and agranulocytosis. The rate of agranulocytosis is about 0.2 per uh, 0.2% and there could be a liver enzyme elevation. If picked up early and if the drugs is drug is stopped, in most people, agranulocytosis would recover. Deferocirox, which is the latest drug, could cause rash, increase in serum creatinine, and increase in liver enzymes. Now, it is, as I said, that most people would require chelation lifelong, and there is a relationship of survival in, at least in thalassemia, it has been shown, to compliance with deferoxamine infusion. If, if the infusions were about 225 to 300 per year versus 0 to 75, you can see that the survival curves are different. Now, the next question that is there is that of these, which of the agents is actually helpful in bringing down the cardiac deaths? And there was, uh, there is a lot of data which is now coming up which suggests that deferiprone may actually mobilize cardiac ion better than the uh, other agents. And uh, this is uh, data that appeared in 2006, and this is a natural history study on deferiprone therapy was associated with significantly greater cardiac production than deferoxamine. If you could see that out of uh, 150, 359 patients, 52 had cardiac events with 10 cardiac deaths, and on deferiprone, nobody had any cardiac event and no cardiac deaths. This year in Hematologica, there is an editorial which talks about this particular thing, but says that maybe that the patients were not really comparable and you have to have more data on th this particular aspect of deferiprone. So there are, there are other trials which also suggested the same thing and uh, this particular trial actually suggests that uh, uh, if in these patients deferiprone was associated with much better uh, myocardial outcomes including a better uh, left ventricular injection fraction. There is some data, experimental data, which also suggests that the oral agents, which are smaller, actually uh, mobilize the cardiac ion better than deferoxamine. Then why not use combination treatment? And there, there are some data which are appearing which suggest that combination may actually bring down serum ferritin better. And uh, however, there are no good prospective data in a larger cohort of patients, and we need to have that kind of a data to really say that both of the agents could be used either together or sequentially. 
This is deferoxyrox trial, and uh, this was the first trial which suggested that deferoxyrox is well tolerated, and there is a GI disturbance that occurs. And this is the trial in thalassemia, which suggested that when used in the dose of 30 milligram per kg, it was equivalent to deferoxamine in chelating iron. Going away from uh, uh, congenital anemias for today's meeting, there is data now that has been analyzed from the EPIC study for patients with aplastic anemia, 116 aplastic anemia patients, and they showed that there was a significant decrease in serum ferritin in, in chelation naive as well as previously chelated patients, and decrease in ALT correlated with decrease in serum ferritin. The issue is, does it make any difference or not? And we are not really very clear about that for the time being. This is one area where uh, we, we could be interested in, and that is iron chelation myelodysplasia, because it has been known that transfusion requirements in myelodysplasia impact prognosis, and there is a high incidence of cardiac failure in transfusion-dependent myelodysplastic patients. But is it because of iron overload, or is it because of the disease, or is it because of comorbidities in a person who's actually elderly? That is not really clear. And retrospective data suggests some improvement in survival, and impact of iron overload on transplantation outcomes is also something that we should keep in mind. Uh, this is um, data for uh, myelodysplastic syndromes in this, and also uh, other anemias, for, for example, diamond black pen and uh, other anemias. And you could actually say that iron chelation efficiency is good and the safety profile is reasonable. So in 2008, a consensus statement was made for treatment of iron overload in myelodysplasia, and that was that if more than two units per month are required for a year, the ferritin levels are more than 1,000 in patients with low-risk myelodysplasia, and life expectancy was at least one year without any comorbidities, and if the candidate, or if the candidate was for, was for allograft, then it could be used in patients with myelodysplasia. It was questioned by several other uh, people, and that could be discussed later. The monitoring is done by serum ferritin, and you, could also, you would also need to do audiometry and eye examination for deferriprone, a weekly CBC and differential, and for deferocerox serum creatinine. When do you withdraw if no further transfusions are required, if there are significant side effects, if the ferritin is less than 500, or if there is very low liver ion? So to summarize, iron chelators have improved survival and quality of life in patients who are transfusion dependent. Current drugs are associated with significant side effects and need careful monitoring. Most deaths occur due to cardiac complications. Chelators with low molecular weight seem to mobilize intracellular iron better. More data on combination treatment is required. Possible benefits in myelodysplasia need confirmation. And cost is still a major concern in the Indian context. Thank you very much.